we're going to chat for about 25 minutes and then we're going to take your questions. So be sure to tweet your questions during this to hashtag iconic tour. Michael, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's get to it because there's a lot to cover. How are you in your apartment in 2011 thinking, gee, razors are expensive. I'm going to take on Gillette and sell cheap razors direct to consumers. How does that even happen? I don't think that was exactly the phraseology <laughs> that, that came in my mind. Um, I think the, the idea for the, for the concept uh, you know, came with the initial frustration, which I had had probably in 2008 or 2007 even when I was um, out of razors and I was walking right by a Dwayne Reed when I was living in New York City. And um, you know, I just didn't even want to go in there to get them because I didn't want to have to deal with the Razor Fortress, which those that don't know what that is, it's our affectionate term for that locked case that Isn't the Razor is behind. It is, and we did a whole campaign about it, um, uh, which is on YouTube and super fun, I think. But it's you know, it was just the the experience was broken, um, and it's such an often used and often need to be replaced, uh, you know, product, and so. There just had to be a better way. So I had that frustration a long time before, and then you know I had the idea for the club uh, when when I was at a, a holiday party in 2009, I think it was, um, with uh, my friend's wife's father who had you know a few a few razors lying around in a warehouse, and I had the idea that this this uh, experience could be improved. What were you doing before? Uh, immediately before? Yeah, I mean, what were, how were you paying the bills before you decided I'm going to create this club? So I was doing some freelance marketing work uh, on the side um, when I was starting Dollar Shave Club. And what made you think of the subscription model? I mean, Netflix was doing it, and now it seems to be so common. But back then, it wasn't common. Yeah, I mean, I, the subscription model itself is not, you know, a lot of people will try to start a subscription business because they love the idea of making monthly revenue, and it sounds really good, and it looks really good in a spreadsheet when you drag it out over a couple years, uh, you know, the, the recurring revenue. But ultimately, you know, only should you launch a subscription business if the nature of the subscription provides an enhanced value for the customer. And razor, it, it's true for razors, because you run out of your razors quite frequently, and if you don't go to the store to buy new ones, or you don't put them in a cart and you're shopping online somewhere, you will end up, you know, you will, if you get a little bit lazy, you'll just milk your existing razor for another couple days, and that's a suboptimal experience, and it's a suboptimal shave. And so what we encourage people to do is change your blade every week, because everybody knows that that fresh blade feels fantastic when you, when, when you, when you, you know, crack it out of the case. And so we said, well, if it came automatically, you would become conditioned to changing your razor more frequently. And people have actually started to change their behavior. So the subscription was not like, and we're going to do subscription, or, or subscription was not like the thing that we set out to do. It was a feature that enhanced the consumer experience. Uh, so you come up with the idea. Your friend's father-in-law's got a warehouse full of surplus razor yeah, blades. Yeah, story for another other. time, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm your first investor. What, what was your pitch? Uh, the pitch was, well, my first first investor, that pitch probably not worth talking about. The first good pitch <laughs> that we made um, was probably in October of 2011. I had been running the business in a beta phase for probably four or five months at the time, and we learned a lot about what the customer wanted and what they were gravitating towards. And uh, I had taken the early proceeds from DSC and put them towards the original launch video, which we launched in March of 2012. So I had this video, um, and the pitch sounded something like, uh, you know, we're gonna. You know, the customer experience is broken. There's a lot of frustration. Um, we have a really great solution to this problem called Dollar Shave Club, and they were like, "Yeah, but like razors online isn't everybody selling razors online?" And you know, what's what's so unique about that? It doesn't sound very fun. I'm like, "Well, we're gonna build a brand around it, and it's gonna be a very compelling brand, and it's gonna resonate, and it'll be fun, and um, ultimately we want to take over the entire bathroom and make it easier for guys to get everything that they need to look, smell, feel, fantastic, blah, blah." blah. And they were like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, like." we don't believe you. And then I was like, well, <laughs> look, don't take it from me. Take it from this guy. And I showed them the video, uh, which I had had, which I had filmed a couple you know, weeks earlier. And they were like, oh, OK, we get it now. And so they, you know, the, first, the first group uh, that wrote a check was Science. They're here in Santa Monica. And uh, they wrote me a $100,000 check. Wow. 
Wow. Actually, they wrote me a $100 check by mistake, and I got all the way to the bank. <laughs> Are you serious? And I was like, yeah, I'm totally serious. Yeah, it was $100, and I got to the bank, and I was like, surely there must be some mistake. <laughs> So I had to walk all the way back to the office and get a new check. Was that like an awkward conversation? Like, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I wish I had taken a picture of that. Yeah. Uh, maybe they were trying, you know, they're, they're a sneaky bunch, you know, maybe they're trying to sneak it by me. What's your advice then to approach investors? You've done it a lot, you've gone through several rounds of funding before you were sold. Yeah, well, it's interesting. You know, after listening to the last presentation, I think there's some really interesting wisdom. How can I help you? Is, a, is was one of the slides that I saw. That's, that's a really interesting way to frame the conversation because every investor is looking for, you know, they're not, they're not investing in you for charity. You know, they're investing because ultimately you can do something for them. So understand what it is that they're looking for and how you and your business idea can help them, which is a really interesting way of, of thinking about it. It's not necessarily how, how I thought, thought about it, but certainly will start if I, if I ever pitch again. But, <laughs> Um, gosh, how to pitch. I mean, at the end of the day, I think what really works well is thinking about what problem you're solving. When you're talking about your business, what, what problem are you trying to solve? And you can define problem loosely. If you're starting a luxury handbag company, you know, is what's the problem you're solving? You can come up with a problem that you're solving there. Um, it's just you, you have to be a little bit more fanciful with your definition of what a problem is, but be very clear about what the consumer problem is and then what your solution is. And I would start, I would start there. The video really does lay out the problem and the solution, and it's hilarious. Who came up with the video? I, I, you shot it in a day and it cost you like 4,500 bucks. Yeah, so I, I wrote the video and it was directed by a friend of mine. And should people consider making a funny video that tells their story? I don't know, I get a lot of that question, you know, maybe, if you're funny. <laughs> <laughs> you studied improv at the Upright Citizens were great. I mean, you have this comedic background or at least you studied it. Yeah. Uh, how has that helped you as an entrepreneur? Well, I think one of the things about improv that I've that, that I always gravitated towards is the rapid fire um, sort of mental process that that you need to go through uh, to to make a scene in in an improv setting funny. Um, so let me say that a little bit more clearly. Y your your brain has to work really quickly to keep up with your scene partners as you develop information. Uh, that an audience can absorb, and you have to react quickly, and uh, you have to think, you have to absorb quickly, think quickly, and react quickly. Um, and that's not to say that you always want to react quickly in business. Um, there are times that you want to be, uh, you know, very measured and take your time. But I think that, you know, outside of the pure sort of comedic training that I got out of improv, um, the quick thinking aspect of it was huge. And also the notion of synthesizing information uh, from different sources and fusing them together, uh, fusing those different pieces of information together to uh, tell a story or develop a solution. And um, that's what you're doing all day as a CEO is you are ingesting bits and pieces of different information and synthesizing it into a strategy, uh, you know, or a, a, an effort of some kind, and you know, I think certainly my improv training helped me uh, do that. And allowed you to pivot quickly. Um, certainly, yeah, I think that's the, I think that's fair. Uh, again, if you have questions, tweet them into hashtag Iconic Tour. We're going to get to them in a bit. What was the hard? You knew branding, you knew marketing, uh, you did, spent some time in television news too, which is very interesting. What was, bit. what was the hardest part about, you know, I mean, you don't know manufacturing, you don't know distribution. What was the hardest part about getting this business up and running? Um, I, always it was fundraising, I think. You know, when you are, when you're starting out and, um, you know, you have a compelling business opportunity, or you have a compelling business, which I think we did right from the beginning, uh, you know, you have to hire great talent. Um, and I guess that's actually probably always the hardest thing, is finding great talent that can do the job that you need them to do, uh, you know, and wooing people to your mission, right? Because there are a zillion great companies out there, and you're not just competing with companies in your own sector. You're competing with companies outside of your sector for the same talent. 
a, a, a fulfillment center director, you know, can work for a company that's selling men's grooming products or a company that's selling baby toys or, or furniture. And, you know, that's your competition. Uh, and the same thing is true for investors. When you're pitching, um, when you're pitching an investor, you're not just competing against others in your sector. They're not just looking at your direct business competition um, from the consumer standpoint. They're also looking at what other investments could I be making? I could be making a software investment. I could be making a consumer products investment, or I could be making you know who, any kind of investment. And so you're up. So your competition is so vast, and so you have to you know know your consumer uh, in that case, which is you know talent or an investor and really try to differentiate yourself. So talent and money was always the biggest. I hear from everybody in this town, in, the, in Southern California, it's so expensive to live here. It is so hard to attract and retain talent because uh, if you're not already living here, you're going to have to pay people a lot of money to move out here and they've got a lot of choices. Have you had, a, has it been a struggle to hire and retain talent? Yeah. How do you do it? Okay. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. I mean, it's, it, you know, there's no, there's no silver bullet. Um, I think it's, you have to find people. I think, look, the first thing is you got to find people that believe in what you're doing uh, and, and want to join you on the journey. If you get that, it makes everything else easier. Yes, the financials need to make sense. Um, but, you know, look, startups do this with a mix of, of you know, monetary compensation and equity. Um, and, and hopefully your business is attractive enough that you can give them enough equity to supplement uh, their total package that, uh, you know, to, to make them take that, that risk. Have you thought of leaving L.A.? Have I? No. Not, not at, I mean, someday maybe, but. <laughs> Good, don't. We need, we need a people who are paying taxes yeah, well, to stay I'm, here. Yes, I. I've <laughs> don't go. Paid a few taxes. Especially now, got, you know, Unilever stock, the whole thing. Just stay, stay. Sure. I love paying uh, taxes. Biggest mistake you've made? Uh, the biggest mistake, um, the biggest mistake that I've made. I don't know. You make you make mistakes every day, um, and sometimes those mistakes add up. Um, I think maybe one of the mistakes. One one thing that you have to do as an entrepreneur. I won't frame this necessarily as a mistake, and that's not because I haven't made them. Because I've made dozens, hundreds, um, but. One thing that you have to do constantly as a CEO is you have to look at what your company needs at that exact moment, talent-wise and resource-wise, to be successful and not get blinded necessarily. And, and you can be blinded by um, you know, working with people that you like and keeping them happy. And um, sometimes you have to do things that don't necessarily make people happy. And that's that's... You know, that's hard to, you develop a muscle for it, I think, but um, you don't ever want to, you know, make people unhappy that have been very helpful to you uh, in, on the journey. And um, I'm being sort of intentionally vague, but I think, you know, making those tough decisions, making tough decisions about people you care about that have been instrumental in your success. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about, you know, letting people go or, or you know, or, or necessarily a reorganization of the company. Um, although those things, those things are, are part of the journey as well. I'm talking just about little, little things you know, throughout, the, throughout the ordinary course of business that you have to maybe shift responsibility from one area to another because there might be a, a better way of handling it. And you know, you just, it's, it's, um, it's tricky. So you would say the mistake is not moving sooner to make those changes, to make those hard decisions, make people unhappy. I think that's a good way of saying it. Uh, when you decided to sell for a billion dollars, making you the most successful, you know, LA startup to go out into the world and do that uh, a year ago, why, uh, why? How did you know it was the right time to sell? Was it the money? Are you addicted to yes? <laughs> what was? What was your thinking? No, I'm, I'm, I might be addicted to yes. I need to think about that. Um, so. Like I said, I, my job as CEO is to look at the company every you know, quarter, uh, and definitely a few times a year, uh, and say, what is the thing that we need to be successful in the next you know, 3, 6, 12, 18 months, 5 years? Um, and at that exact moment, 
what I needed was I needed partnership um, in, a, in a few different ways. One, one, one thing that Unilever brought to the table is global grooming uh, research and experience and expertise. I don't come from a personal grooming background. Um, we definitely have experts on our team uh, that, that, are, that are wonderful, but we have global ambitions and Unilever is a global personal care company and they, you know, if I want to know what kind of, you know, oil people are using in their hair in India, um, I can pick up the phone and I have access to that information. Whereas that information would cost, cost Dollar Shave Club a lot of money uh, if we were to do it, try to figure that out ourselves. So research and expertise in, in, in our sector was key. We hadn't had any of that on our board of directors prior to the acquisition. Uh, we had very talented business operators and investors on our board, but uh, nobody in sort of personal care and grooming. Um, so that was one. And then the other one was uh, financial backing. So every year we raise money. Uh, we'd raised money every year for five years, starting in 2011. Uh, and um, that's a huge distraction. It would take three months of the year, and it's, in, it's incredibly taxing on you and the team. It's like running for office, it sounds like. And everything, it, it's a good parallel. Um, you know, everything grinds to a halt uh, for three months or six months if you're not having success. Uh, and that's, that's really difficult. Um, and so, so what we found in, in Unilever was a strategic backer that uh, was invested in our mission, that believed in the construct, that um, is looking to future-proof uh, you know, the organization. And not only that, we got along. Uh, and so it made a lot of sense for us to make that deal at that time. But we never picked up the telephone and said, hey, you, know, you should buy us. That wasn't, we weren't looking for an exit at, the, at that time. Did you, when you heard a billion dollars, I mean, did you, was the original number lower? And you said, nah, never mind, because that's a big number. It's it's listen. It's a big. It's definitely a big number. Um, and you know, yeah. I mean, when you hear that number, it's it's a big number. It's like <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so you're Correct. wealthy now. You're wealth. You're very wealthy now. How is that? You changed? don't know that. Uh, oh, you don't, you don't oh know. I'm I'm. If you're not, something's gone wrong. Mm. Um, it, how has that changed your life? Um, interesting question. Uh, well, I don't know. How has it changed my life? Um, not much, if you can believe that. Um, and I'm not being, I'm not being like falsely modest or, or humble about it. But you know, I didn't run out and buy myself a Porsche. You know, I have, you know, I, you know, I, I still drive my my Chevy Volt, which is great. I mean, I only drive two miles a day, but it's, look, it's. How has it changed my life? Uh, you know, I get a lot more pitches from people. Ah. <laughs> like you can't go anywhere without like, oh, you're the Dollar Shave guy. Yeah, it's mostly, it's mostly LinkedIn. I mean, you know, I, I get a lot in person too, but a lot of, on LinkedIn. I mean, one guy pitched me this idea uh, for like, um, you know, recyclable underpants made from avocados. <laughs> and it's like. <laughs> That's right, in your wheelhouse with the whole club, you know, own the bathroom. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think the name, if I remember the company, is called Planties. <laughs> I'm not making this up. I'm not making okay, this I'm, up. I'm this is out it there. Out. This I, is a real pitch. I can show it. I am. Uh, I, I think I posted it on my Instagram. I'm so. going to follow up on that yeah. later on my own. Yeah. Uh, what advice do you have for people in uh, managing a board of directors? Um, it's funny. So. I got some really great advice from uh, Mike Jones, who is my first board member, uh, who works at Science, who's one of the founders of Science uh, in Santa Monica. And I'll butcher the exact phrase that he, that he used, but it was like, a board meeting is like the quarterly or bi-monthly um, opportunity for the board to reassess whether or not the CEO should still have his or her job. <laughs> And it was like, holy shit. Okay. <laughs> and that was like, and that was in a room full of a few entrepreneurs that, that, that they had invested in early on. Uh, but he was right. And that's, that's, what, that's what it is. You know, your board meetings, you know, I think people get a that, I, that it shouldn't freak you out, but board meetings are, I think, a wonderful sort of exercise. I am not one of these people that, that has a, a problem with 
management or having a boss. I think governance is a good thing. And I think it's great primarily for the entrepreneur, more so than the board of directors um, or the investors. Because when you have to prepare for a board meeting, you have to look at your business in a unique way than you look at it every day. You have to step back and you have to explain your business to people who aren't looking at your business every single day, which means you have to look at it fundamentally differently. And so the way you package up your business for a board meeting and the way you look at it differently, because you look at it differently, you're gaining insights that you otherwise wouldn't because you're digging deeper for data and you're drawing conclusions. And so you always come out of that board meeting with um, with, with like wonderful insights and some great next steps for yourself and for your management team. And um, I think that when you can produce that, so you know, over prepare for your board meetings because it is true, they are judging you. Um, and at the end of the meeting, you'll leave the room and your board will talk about you and they'll say, hey, you know, how, did, how, did, how did you do? And do you, you know, what are we missing? Uh, and what message do we, what feedback do we want to give to the CEO? And so that is, so over prepare, but over prepare for yourself because you're going to get more out of the board meeting than your board probably is. Hmm. What advice do you have about strategic planning? Because um, you were talking about, you know, three, six, 12, 18 months. Yeah, I mean, you know, how long do we have? Um, <laughs> I, I think it's, it's, it, it is a tricky exercise doing strategic planning right, especially in a highly competitive, ever-changing market. Um, because you're constantly trying to get your bearings. And you're constantly trying to figure out, how do I plant the flag 18 months out, three years out, five years out, while still trying to operate today's business, and with a small team, and with limited resources. But um, you know, a strategic planning exercise looks at you know, all of the um, you know, where do you want, you know, where do you want to sell? What markets do you want to be in? What channels do you want to sell in? Um, what, what products do you want to sell? Who is your consumer? Answering those questions for like today, next year, three years down the road, Can five years down the road. Can you even look three years down the road right now? It's very difficult. I mean, it's, it's, I'm not saying that we don't, but it's, it's, I think it's, it's hard to get a thumb in the wind. Um, but look, at the end of the day, we're, you know, the product that we're selling, the products that we're selling are personal care and grooming products. The way we sell that to you and the way we package all that up together, I think we know exactly what we want to do now, two years from now, five years from now, and how we want to evolve that. And then you just, you, you will have to change that inevitably as, as you go. Nobody expects you to have, you know, everything fixed for more than, you know, a probably six to 18 month window. You do have tremendous competition now. Everybody's got a shaving club, and Harry's is gaining share, I think. Uh, Gillette, of course, has fought back with a shaving club. How do you uh, maintain dominance? So, like I've, I've, I've always said this, you know, we weren't the first people to sell razors on the internet. Um, we aren't going to be the last to sell razors all, all the in, on the internet. Um, the, way that you, the way that you beat your competition is by building something that the competition can't build, um, doesn't want to build, um, you know, and, and can't even imagine. And that's what we're doing for the next act of, of DSC, uh, which is, is a little too early to kind of talk about right now. But ultimately, you have to build something that's induplicable. It's, it's um, you know, I don't want to trivialize what we did, but to sell razors on the internet um, or to bring your razors to a retail store um, there's nothing inherently innovative about that. It's the way you do it, and it's the way you talk about it, and the problem that you're solving uh, that, that means everything. And so we solved that problem, um, I think, pretty well. And other people, naturally, as happens with great ideas, will follow you into that space, whether they're big guys or small guys. Uh, but but you know, what, what Act 2 is for DSC is all about building uh, something that doesn't exist and that the other guys couldn't even dream up. One more question before we take questions from the audience. Um, what are you learning culturally about other shaving norms? I mean, what's the most interesting thing you've learned so far? Um, probably not something I can share on stage. Uh, <laughs> well, oh. I did talk about planties. Yeah, um, yeah, really. Where do you go from there? Yeah, um, I don't know. I think you, I think what you kind of realize about you know sh shaving in general is a lot of people, you know, shaving has this like 
some brands really lean into this. Um, some some brands really lean in. Were everybody okay? into that? Were the insights too too intense back there? Um, Somebody's planties. Uh, yeah, right. Um, I hope everyone's all right. Yeah, I hope everyone. um, so culturally, shaving. culturally shaving. Yeah. So some brands really lean into this, but you know, shaving. Some brands want you to believe that like shaving is this incredibly in, amazing ritual, and like. I'm waking up in the morning and I'm like, it's very quiet. And I mix up my, my butter and my lather and I look at myself in the mirror and I thank myself for being me. And, you know, put the cream on and then like, you know, I'm, here's how I'm gonna kick ass today. It's not real. Like most guys are half asleep when they shave. They don't wanna shave. It's shaving is a pain in the ass. They wanna scrape the hair off their face as fast as possible, get in the shower and get on with their day. And so I think that that's kind of, you know, the romance around shaving, like it's not the 40s where you're going and sitting in a chair and having a straight razor shave and, you know, getting smacked around by another guy, you know, <laughs> it's like, um, you know, I mean, some people do that, that's fine. I, I've had a straight razor shave, I didn't particularly love it, but um, yeah, I think that's what you learn about the culture of shaving. It's a, uh, it's, it's not as robusto as I think people want you to believe. <laughs> All right, we'll take a question um, from Bradley Beeson. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Michael, you seem to have mastered the art of not taking yourself too seriously while still being a highly respected CEO. How? What keeps you humble? Um, I think that, you know, because I don't think that you ever, you've never made it. You know, I don't think that I've ever made it. I mean, we've had some, we've, we've had some great success for sure, uh, but we haven't, you know, I, I still don't believe that we've made it. We've got a lot of challenges, wonderful challenges. I'm excited about them. And um, you're, you're not even 40. Where are you going to be at 50? Uh, where am I going to be at 50? I don't know. I'll see you at Iconic Tour 2000, <laughs> whatever. Whatever. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I'm, I'm not thinking that far in advance. Um, but yeah, look, you just you keep yourself humble because it's just like I, I have always. You know, I, I come from Philadelphia, which is like, you know, we're like the consummate underdog. We're like the underdog people. Um, and, and I just think that you always have this psychology of, of, at least I do, you know, we're going to, you know, we're, we've never made it. We've never won. You always have more to, to do. Uh, from Neil Thornhill, was there a personal challenge you needed to overcome to grow your business? A personal challenge? Um, to grow the business, yeah. To grow the business. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think you, you, make, you make personal sacrifices all the time. I, when you, you know, I started this business in my apartment, and it was very personal to me. It still is personal to me. Um, and I, uh, you know, you have to find a way to try to make it impersonal at the right moments uh, because it can dominate your, your psyche if you don't. From James Betcher, Dollar Shave Club, what is your favorite, most influential brand, and why? Um, I draw a lot of inspiration from Starbucks, um, and, and I won't qualify which Starbucks, because there have been many Starbuckses uh, over, over time. Um, but I think that that story is such a great story about, a, that, you know, you know, one man's passion for a particular product and the ritual and the culture around it and how before that in the United States there wasn't a lot of romance and culture around this hugely significant moment in your day. And now we have these temples of coffee everywhere. And it's not just Starbucks, it's doing it. It's, there's, and there are shapes and flavors for every type of, of coffee house, but you know, these are places where people come to, uh, you know, plan their businesses. I mean, you know, half of businesses, I'm sure, have been started or worked on in a Starbucks or, or a coffee shop. And, um, you know, it's like how you think about, and then this place where families come together over coffee, you know, sometimes at their home, but also at a Starbucks. And so I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of, of inspiration to draw from, from that brand. I've always wondered how much Starbucks has contributed to the economy as being a place where all you had to do is, you know, can I have a gla glass of water? And, you know, you do real or estate Or use the bathroom. Or, exactly, and you do these deals. 
uh, from Hartmut Eggert, uh, Iconic Tour. What kept you motivated and what advice would you give someone who is thinking about starting a business but who is hesitating? Well, I think that, I think that you know, if you're hesitating, then you shouldn't do it. I think that if you're going to do it, if you believe enough in the idea um, and your passion, you know, if, if you're the type of person that's going to start a business, you're just going to start a business. You're not going to sit around and like hem and haw about it for too long. You're going to consider the risk, but you're going to be so excited about the idea that you're going to just plow through whatever roadblocks um, you know, come at you. And I, so I, I don't think it's a choice. I think if you're hesitating, you need to ask yourself, why am I hesitating and what do I not, what am I missing or, or you know, Probably not a good idea to do it. Uh, I am curious. If you have any questions to tweet, it's hashtag Iconic Tour. This is sort of out of left field, but not really. I mean, the beard craze. Has the beard craze hurt uh, razor sales? Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> not enough to really matter. And how much of your, how, what percentage of your customers are women? Uh, good question. I think that number fluctuates, but a, a decent chunk, double digits. Has there, is there any idea of sort of creating this, you know, more feminine club thing for women? We've talked about it. Um, it's never completely off the table, but I think that, you know, the problems that we're looking to solve um, uh, are, are for, in this category, in the personal care space, are, are the ones that men are experiencing as it relates to kind of looking good, smelling good, feeling good. We understand guys really well. Um, and, you know, I think there is a big opportunity out there for, for women, although, again, you know, women are, are very happy using our service. Um, but, again, the problems I think that we're focused on are ones unique to, to guys. From a Mark Poden, I'm hoping I pronounced that right. How do you stay ahead of your competitor when your solution to a problem can be duplicated by your competitors? Yeah, I mean, I, look, it, it's going to happen. Um, competitors will copy you. Um, they'll take, you know, a little bit of a different, you know, take on it. If you know, if your if your pizza has pepperoni, they'll put peppers on it, right? And they'll talk about how peppers are the the best the best thing. Um, so it's. It's just you, you have to find a unique way to deliver your solution. Um, it's, it's, you know, and try to dream up things that they, can't, that they can't do or would take them a really long time to do. I don't know if you can talk about it, but when the 800-pound gorilla in the razor blade room sues you, mm -hmm. what is that like? Well, I mean, you know, since the beginning, that 800-pound gorilla, you know, we, we've kind of been on their radar. First, they copied us with their Gillette Shave Club. Um, then, then they sued us, and I think that you expect that, frankly. It doesn't keep you up at night? That? No. What keeps you up at night? Many things. <laughs> uh, last question. Uh, oh, I think, no, we already, that, that's the one we had. Was that the last question, Sam? You want to give me just one thing that keeps you up at night? One thing that keeps me up at night. Um, Let's see. Uh, I think you always worry about. I think you always worry about talent. Um, you you know, anybody that has any has had any success will tell you that that this is a, a the ultimate team sport, and you have to find great talent and keep great talent. Um, and by great, not just very talented, but appropriately appropriately talented. Um, and, and that's tricky. You don't, you know, at the end, at the end of the day, that's, that's people. And you worry about your people. They're the, they're, it sounds trite, but they are the most important part of your organization, about your, I'm sorry, about your company. It's, you know, your customers are hugely important, but, you know, to serve the customers well, you need talented people in-house. And um, I, I worry a lot about, about that life cycle. Michael Dubin, thank you very much. Yeah. That was great. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.